Welcome. My name is Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted that you've joined us today. We have a fabulous program covering many centuries in one hour, so you're in for quite the whirlwind this hour. My dear friend and colleague Mariana Brantes is in Portugal, and this program concerns Spain and Portugal. We always like to bring our programs as much as possible back to our hero, Aristides de Souza Mendes, who was Portuguese. And so Mariana is our moderator, and she will be introducing our speakers. So Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivia. And a warm welcome to our distinguished speakers and our new and returning guests. I am Mariana Brantes, and I am joining you from sunny Lisbon, where we are enjoying a lovely four-day weekend full of tradition. Last Friday, June 10th, we celebrated the creation of Portugal 879 years ago. Since Portugal is a country of diaspora, this was celebrated also in the US. You may have had a celebration near you. Tomorrow, June 13th, is the day of St. Anthony of Lisbon and of Padua. It will be celebrated with street parties, grilled sardines, folk music, the works. Uh, allow me also to recall that this week in 1940, our hero, Aristides Sosa Mendes, faced a dramatic dilemma to follow the severe restrictions of Circular 14 imposed by the dictator Salazar or to grant life-saving visas to the thousands of refugees besieging the Portuguese consulate in Bordeaux, France. After much reflection, Aristides chose to follow his conscience and uh, undertook one of the largest rescue actions of World War II. For that, he was severely punished by Salazar, but he was recognized as a righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem in 1966. In 2020, Pope Francis declared June 17th as a day of conscience, inspired by that extraordinary act, act of conscience of Aristides de Sousa Mendes. So, truth will out. Portugal, uh, Portugal's president, Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa, who is in, himself of Jewish descent, once welcomed um, one of SMF's uh, Jewish groups by saying, your history is our history. So it is quite fitting that in this Portuguese holiday week, we have the chance to hear Doreen Carvajal and Jeannie Milgram tell us how they went back centuries to trace their hidden roots in Spain and Portugal. Doreen Carvajal was born and raised in California. Welcome, Doreen. And studied journalism at UC Berkeley. She's a former New York Times culture reporter and the author of uh, The Forgetting River, A Modern Tale of Survival, Identity, and the Inquisition, which details her family story, which we will hear uh, next. And we, and she's based in Paris and is a co-founder of the Orphan Art Project, which aids descendants seeking restitution of looted art. She appears in the film Stealing Italy, part of the documentary series Hunting Nazi Treasury, Treasure. Uh, Jeannie Milgram was born in Havana, Cuba, in a Roman Catholic family of Spanish ancestry. She was able to document her maternal lineage back to 1405 to her Jewish ancestors in pre-Inquisition Spain and Portugal. Jeannie is the past president of the Jewish Genealogical Society of Greater Miami and uh, also the past president of the Society for Crypto-Jewish Crypto Judaic Studies. And she's the author of several books, including My 15 Grandmothers, The Manual, How I Found My 15 Grandmothers, and others. Jeannie is the director of the Converso Genealogy Project, which um, uh, is scanning Inquisition files around the world, I presume, including Portugal, Torre do Tongo. So, Jeannie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Olivia, to Michael, <clears throat> Mariana, thank you. It really is a pleasure to be here today. And uh, all of us have very long stories. We're gonna move very quickly. Um, I have to go back to 623 years. So I think I get like a year, a second. So uh, I wanna start with a timeline of the Inquisition to put everybody uh, un to understand what years we're talking about before I tell you my story. So the, the largest mass conversion of Jews in, in history was in 1391. 
this, and it actually began in 1381. This is when my family was converted. 1478, the Spanish Inquisition is actually uh, established. People are always focused on 1492, but 1492 is when they were uh, expulsed out of Spain, not Portugal yet. Many of them fled to Portugal because as you can see, the official start of the Inquisition was in 1536. When the Jews fled in 1492, by and large, they went to the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, uh, Morocco, Algeria, all that part of the world. And those are the Jews that we know today to be the Sephardic Jews. They melded uh, with those, uh, let's say those cultures. 1540 was the first Alto da Fe, that was the first parade, let's say, where Jews were burned at the stake, uh, already converted to Catholic, but not being true Catholics. 1560, um, the Portugal started going around the world with a very long arm, and they set up in Goa, India, they set up in, in other parts of the world. Um, so it continued around the world. Uh, next slide. Okay, 1569, the Inquisition courts or tribunals of Spain set up court in the New World. So they came to this side um, of the world. They set up in Mexico City, which is actually the most famous one, but they were very, very, uh, let's say cruel in Lima, Peru, Cartagena, Colombia, and in other countries. But this is where the tribunals were, meaning this is where they were being burned alive, even though there were offices all over in every single country, Brazil, etc. This is where they were burning people. 1834, look how many years it was officially outlawed. So we're talking already centuries. Uh, 1858, the Jews are allowed to return to Spain and worship under the laws of religious freedom. Some did, but many did not. 1924 was the first attempt by the Spanish government to have a return of the descendants who had been expelled. 1968, the Vatican symbolically revokes the edict of expulsion. It took a long time. And 2016 starts uh, laws to be enacted in Spain and then Portugal to grant citizenship to the descendant of the crypto Jews and the Sephardic Jews. The one in Spain, the opportunity to do that is finished. It is still ongoing in Portugal. Okay, so I can start now and I will tell you my story. And I live now in Miami, Florida. My family left Cuba um, when Fidel Castro came into power. So I've been here since I was four. Please don't do the math. And it was at that time that I was put into Catholic schools. Uh, they were only one generation in Cuba. My uh, family was from Spain. They were from a tiny village on the west of Spain, right on the border with Portugal. They lived there for 623 years, although some of them went back and forth and Portugal, Spain, up a little bit more, but more or less in the same geographical area. And my grandparents were also born in this village and they were first cousins. I was put into a Catholic school immediately, like uh, Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, and then a Catholic university. And so like, like there was no end to it, but from the age of six or seven, I felt inside me that something was wrong. It just, I couldn't, I didn't feel like I belonged to the people that I had been born to which is a very disconcerting uh, thought for a child. I felt I didn't understand what was going on around me. My mom and dad and grandparents would drop my sister and I off at the church on Sundays because our school required us to go to church, but they wouldn't step into the church. So my sister and I were by ourselves, imagine a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, like we're at the foot of the stairs of the church, all these big Cuban families, everybody kissing and hugging, you know, multiple generations and the visual, my sister and I at the door waiting to be picked up after the Catholic mass. So that th there was a lot of this kind of thing going around in the background, but you know, a little kid is a little kid. It just, you go on and I, I felt uncomfortable. I, I didn't buy into the Catholic dogma. Unfortunately, I was always a very deep thinker. And I say, unfortunately, because for me, it's always been hard to be the one to, you know, be up on the monkey bars and not be thinking. 
Um, I went through my schooling very quickly. Um, I was in the university by the time I was 15 and only then Catholic nuns, women, I was able to start asking questions because up until then I was getting uh, punished for questions. However, even though I had questions and doubts and I'm thinking about this all the time, I was still a spiritual leader. Uh, I've always been very spiritual. I'm not sure I like the word religious, but I guess at some point it's the same thing. And it was then that I came across the understanding of, of Judaism. And it just blew my, my mind apart because it was kind of the basics of Catholicism. But life took over. I got married, Cuban Catholic man. I had two children. And by the time I was 28 years old, and I saw myself doing the same rituals to my children that I, it's just, I, I really couldn't do it anymore. This is a very painful story for me to tell. And I always say that whether I tell it in five minutes or I tell it in an hour and a half or in an elevator, this was not an easy transition out of an elite Cuban Catholic family in Miami with certain, uh, let's say, uh, social mores. Uh, it was difficult for my mom. It was difficult for my, my friends, but Unfortunately, as I started to pursue Judaism at the age of 28, I uh, pretty much lost everybody. And it was just me alone with my kids. And my son was 15 at the time, my daughter was three. And it was a very, very difficult time for me. I started going through many different uh, types of synagogues um, until I finally made the decision to have a formal conversion, Orthodox, very traditional, very strict, but not so different from the strictness that I had grown up with as a Catholic. So it took me five and a half years to make that conversion. I had no idea I had these roots, um, even though my grandmother just kept telling me it's so dangerous, what you're doing so dangerous. And then my grandmother dies and she leaves me a couple of artifacts of, of jewelry. I will show you some slides in a minute. And I realized that all these years that my grandmother's teaching me family traditions, they're actually Jewish traditions. And it's so it, it was just like such a, a blend of identities. And you go from this identity of being a Catholic child, then a Catholic woman, then an Orthodox Jewish woman. And it's just, you know, and, and most of the time by myself. And, and I don't know why, but it's made a lot of people angry. Um, forget being supportive, it just made a lot of people angry. I guess when you shake the foundations of others, it's very difficult. But anyway, on the day that my grandmother died and left me those artifacts, she also, my mom also gave me a family tree that took the family back to 1725 or so. Um, and that tree showed that there were centuries of cousin intermarriages. And by then I had studied enough and knew about the hidden Jews in Spain to know that they only married their cousins. So I went to a genealogist in Spain. I was able to bring all this documentation um, out of the archives. Uh, I started writing. I started writing more. I wrote my first book, My 15 Grandmothers, when I started to see that at the end of the tree or the beginning of the tree, however you want to say it, they were practicing Jews. And they were getting caught by the Inquisition again and again and again and again. Eventually, I was able to find 22 grandmothers in a row and their judgments in the Inquisition where it gave all of the genealogy. So I was able to see that the family was converted in 1381. I packed up all that stuff and boxes and boxes and boxes of there was it was a time it was many years ago there were no flash drives you didn't run around with a little thumb drive no you ran around with those big you know office boxes full of um, files and i took it to israel and i wanted to be told i wanted to confirm i wanted to validate i don't know what the appropriate word is but i wanted it forever to be known that I had been born Jewish. And this was of utmost important to me because I did not convert my children. Even though uh, my catalyst and my impetus to, to, to 
change at the age of 28 so that I wouldn't do the same thing to my kids, I fully realized that I'm having an existential crisis. And I was young, but I was never really young. It was always like a very, uh, let's say, old soul or whatever. I did not want to do that. So I did not convert my kids. So being Jewish is like my most proud thing in the world. I am probably the proudest Jew you've ever met. So I wanted this for my children and <clears throat> I wanted to be told that I had been born Jewish. So they took a couple of years in Israel with all of my documents, somebody actually read them. And at the high Jewish court in Jerusalem, I was told that um, I got a beautiful letter saying that God had brought me around in a very different way to, to this, but that from that moment on, nobody can question that all my ascendants on the maternal line, because traditional Judaism is on a maternal line by traditional, I mean, Orthodox, um, and that all my descendants and my ascendants would be Jews, which would make my children Jewish, which was just the highest point in my life. And I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll save everybody the question, which is what about my kids today? So my kids are grown, they have children. Um, they respect the work tremendously. This was an awful uh, a turmoil time in their lives. Uh, neither of them are particularly uh, religious. If you ask my son, uh, he, he lives in Maryland, he will say, um, I'm Catholic, but I have a heavy Jewish ancestry. If you ask my daughter what she is, she will say, I'm Catholic, but mom has Jewish ancestry. So it's just kind of the way um, that each one perceived uh, their ancestry. So they don't really practice anything. Um, and that's fine. I, I think that everybody comes to this knowledge in a different way. And that's fine as well. So um, I will want to show you the slides right now. So you can see a little bit about the evidence that I uncovered uh, to prove uh, to the rabbis that I was indeed Jewish. Next. Next slide. Okay, my grandmother left me the Star of David earrings and she left me this Hamsa, which is a hand of God. This Hamsa is also, uh, uh, let's say, something that is used by the Muslims or the Moors. However, in the case of my grandmother, these were left to me on the morning after she died by my mom. And my grandmother had been to my wedding. I remarried many years later, my husband now, Michael, Ashkenaz from a rabbinical Hasidic family, very strict. Um, and my grandmother knew I married him, she came. So un I understand that other cultures have this, but in my case, this is uh, Jewish. Next. Okay, so I'm the village of my ancestors. I had to go back. The rabbis wanted me to prove that there had been a Jewish presence there. Um, and this was a staircase where I found an underground uh, synagogue with an oral tradition. You go down, it had like, uh, you could see it had been carved out to, to seat people underground. And it was at that moment in that synagogue uh, that I made it my life to go around telling this story because I feel that my family having been relegated to be in a place that's full of cockroaches is just not only is it a shame on what happened historically, but so few people knew about this or know about this. I talk about this all the time. And this, as I was walking down the stairs, I understood that this was the one day lost to Jewish history. Next. Okay, so I found things in the village of my ancestors like this. This is a cross, but historians came with me. I had to prove there were Jews there. So I had to find stuff like this. So this is a cross. It's sitting on top of the 12 little balls, 12 tribes of Israel. On the top, you see, it looks a little bit like a menorah and it is carved with the Hebrew letters, Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, which is a name of God. So obviously someone was carving this into the walls. Next. So underneath the village of my ancestors, as I said, tiny little village, I think maybe 300 people live there today. Every structure 
every single little house is joined to the next little house. So they dug through this granite. It's on a granite mountain and you could go. I Sometimes I stand, sometimes I'm on my stomach. A couple of months ago, someone called me that they had found some menorahs, uh, Jewish candelabras etched on the walls. And I'm heading back there in July to, to document that. Next. So the very uh, rudimentary coat of arms on the left, you can see the name of the village, Fermoseye, um, in English letters. But when you turn it around, the letters are in Hebrew. And it says in Hebrew, Lisgor, which means closed. So this history was closed until I got there because it had never been opened before. Next. Uh, I received hundreds, I didn't receive, when my mom, uh, I had to move her out of the house with Alzheimer's, I found in her kitchen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of recipes, some of them leading back to the Inquisition. She never told me about this. She never shared this information with me. Unfortunately, I only got it after she had Alzheimer's, but I took all of this and I did write a book, The Recipes of My 15 Grandmothers. Next. So one of the main recipes, uh, this is my Tia Paulita from the 1800s. She was the last one that wrote this down. They used to make this recipe that looked like pork chops. It's really French toast, had a little uh, burnt uh, toast sticking in it. And they would be eating this so that people, and we're talking inquisition times, people would think that they were eating pork chops and then they would take a real pork chop and they would throw it in the fire and smell the, the house up of pork, but they would never eat pork. In all those 623 years of recipes that I found, they kept kosher, they didn't mix meat and milk, uh, they never ate non-kosher animals. My family kept kosher until somewhere about 1940 Cuba, when they started to eat shellfish and pork. So this went on for centuries. Next. Okay, so this is my own tree before 1600. It's just a quick visual. Um, I, I want to show you everything that is in olive green here are people and whole families that were burned to death directly on my maternal tree. Old people, young people, kids, every, everything you can imagine killed, burned, uh, and there was no mercy for anyone. So I descend directly from the boxes that are in purple coming down. So the last entry here, I think is 1600. And then obviously we have a lot of, uh, of you know, road to travel before this. Next. So these are the books I've written in English and Spanish. I started with my 15 grandmothers. Then with all the archival material that I found, you can imagine boxes and boxes of last wills and testaments, you know, engagement documents, marriage certificate. I had to prove that these grandmothers were linked by every single document. So I wrote Pyre to Fire from archival material. Then I wrote the recipes of my 15 grandmothers. You can see my grandmother's face there. Um, and it, it's her, her great grandparents is the picture below her. And then how I found the grandmother so that people could follow a path, my own path, it worked. And then they are in Spanish. So uh, next, and I believe that this is it. I thank you so much. And uh, I know we've gone very fast. There will be questions at the end, but it is my distinct pleasure to pass uh, this uh, room right now on to Doreen Carvajal. Uh, we met at a conference and we became fast buds. We share a similar background and it is really truly my honor to pass this to you, Doreen. Uh, thank you, Jeannie. It's a pleasure to be here and I hope we're addressing some of the questions that you may have about our journeys. Um, I'm gonna start by just telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I was raised a Catholic in the San Francisco Bay Area, the daughter of a Costa Rican immigrant whose roots stretched back to 
Costa Rica and uh, to Spain to the 15th century. Um, I went to Catholic school like Jeannie, uh, beanies, uh, plaid skirts, uh, fish on Friday, family of six kids, um, very Catholic. Um, so it would take me years to unravel our Jewish identity, which my ancestors hid in plain sight over generations. And to achieve this, I realized you had to observe, you had to ask the right questions and make mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. Maybe some of you were doing your own genealogy research right now. But like every family history, the story of my ancestors intersected with big dramas a Vatican power struggle, a Spanish Inquisition investigation, um, and an ancient quarter in Segovia infested with neighborhood spies. So join me on this journey for a few minutes and think of your own family history at the same time, because everyone has a story that's a gift to pass on to the next generation. Uh, my quest started with my name, Carvajal. Um, my byline with my name appeared regularly in the New York Times and the Philadelphia Inquirer. So I was often asked about its origins. Someone from Israel wrote me to see if I was related to another Carvajal. While I was reporting a story in Philadelphia, a rabbi told me that my last name was a Sephardic Jewish name from the Iberian Peninsula. But uh, it was intriguing, but at that stage of my life, it had no context. I, I didn't really know what it meant. Um, but eventually, I guess uh, in middle age, I started to realize that my name was trying to tell me something. It means lost place. And that is what I started searching for in my middle age, a little late to start asking questions because some key older relatives had died. It was a calling that led me on a journey that, that changed my notions of identity and belonging. I started with what I knew, which is what everyone should do who's doing their genealogy history. I had a thick folder of the family tree created by my father who just turned 89 a few days ago. Um, birth and, and death records were available through the Mormon site, familysearch.com. Um, as in, during my quest over time, things uh, evolved on the internet and became easier to find databases um, and to find you know, records that told you minutia about your families. I moved through the family tree, finding information not only about relatives, but their friends who were witnesses, I discovered records of special dispensations for cousins to get married. Um, this goes back to what uh, Jeannie was talking about in her family. Um, it's a clue to secret Jewish past. Endogamy was widely practiced among secret Jews because it was a way to protect their secrets among other families that were trusted. Um, my family was um, really unique. Um, and you just had to observe the way they acted to get a sense of that they were hiding something in plain sight. Um, in the center with glasses is my great grandfather, Albert, who was um, a tax collector. Um, like many of the men in the family, he had a habit of staying away from the church. When my father made First Communion, his father didn't go to the church for the First Communion. Um, they, this was a family that would have their family dinners on Saturdays, and that would, they would happen after my great-grandfather would come back from a meeting with men that included a rabbi. Um, Behind him on the left, upper left with her hair parted in the middle is my uh, great aunt Luz. Um, and she ends up emerging as kind of the keeper of the secrets in the family, which was typical of um, descendants of Converso Jews. Um, the women guarded the rituals and they were um, passing them on in the privacy of the home. Um, it was easier for them to preserve secrets. And interestingly, her name, Luce, means the light. Um, next um, uh, slide, please. Um, among the other things that they would do is they would um, uh, bury someone like the day after someone died. Um, they, they followed a number of rituals that if you paid attention, you would know that there was something unique about them. Um, 
this is my uh, grandfather, Julio Chacon. Um, when I had a wall, which is typical when you're doing your genealogy research on the Carvajal line, then I started researching um, my uh, great grandfather, Julio Chacon, the father of my grandfather, uh, grandmother, Angela Chacon. Um, he was an accountant who um, died very young, and um, he led me to the Arias Davila family. Uh, next slide, please. My grandmother, Angela Chacon, in the center here, emigrated to the United States in the 1940s with my father, Arnoldo, and his sister, Eugenia. Like, like many people, I made the error of never asking my grandmother about our family's past. But Mamita, as we called her, left clues. Before she died, she left strict orders that she did not want a priest to preside over her funeral. My aunt Duhenya did the same. When I asked my aunt whether we had a Jewish background, she was evasive and told me she didn't know and that it wasn't something people talked about then. It was another error on my part when I was doing this kind of research on a sensitive family issue. The way to learn about a sensitive past is by asking neutral questions. How did they grow up? What did they eat? What were their activities on the weekend, et cetera? But I, I learned the lesson too late. Um, I can, as part of my quest, I kept working through these records that I was finding online. Um, and next slide, please. And um, that led me to the Arias Davila family and Segovia, Spain. Um, I traced that, that side of the family back to the 15th century to my grandfather and grandmother 16 times removed. They lived in Segovia and uh, as I mentioned earlier, their name was the Arias Davila family. I was really fortunate because I learned more about some of uh, those ancestors than my own relatives today. And that was thanks to um, meticulous inquisition records uh, that were kept to investigate the family for heresy in 1486. The patriarch was Diego Arias Davila, who was King Enrique IV's wealthy royal treasurer. He and his wife were Jewish, but their families converted pre-inquisition when they were very young. But still they maintained their ties to Jewish relatives, practicing rituals behind closed doors, in the tower mansion where they live, not far from that fortress that we just looked at. For these rituals, Diego and other Jewish ancestors who were Christian converts were investigated by the Spanish Inquisition. Their crime, maintaining a double Jewish life in secret. Diego and his wife were investigated only after they died. That was because of a power struggle between the Inquis Inquisitor Torquemada and Diego's son, Juan, the Bishop of Segovia for 30 years. It was common, by the way, for many secret Jewish families to steer a son into the priesthood to have access to education and books, Bibles. To attack the priest, Torquemada went after his family, uh, one, the, the, the bishop's family, and their dramas today are preserved in leather-bound inquisition books in the Madrid National Archives, where I, I found them. There are almost 200 handwritten pages in old Spanish devoted to the daily habits of the Arias Davila family. Wedding rituals, burial clothes, prayers, food customs, even Diego's cranky refusal to allow priests by his bedside as he was dying. He ordered them out cursing, according to the Inquisition records. Why did the Inquisition investigate the dead? If they were successful, it meant they could have dug up their bones, burned them in a ritual out of the fe, fire, and confiscated the family's property, most important, money, wealth. I started to understand why generations of my relatives kept their identity secret. Um, next slide, please. To find the history of my family, I realized I also had to immerse myself in their past. You can't find everything on some internet database. In Segovia, I found missing history because of talking to local people. The woman at the tourism office told me about a PH candidate preparing her thesis on the Arias Davila family. 
That writer told me about a book published in 1981 that contained all the transcripts drawn from the investigation of Diego and his wife. I had the good fortune to participate in a documentary called The Children of the Inquisition. One of the producers found a Spanish history professor in New York who knew about a backyard chapel in a garden in Segovia with the funeral sculptures of my ancestors. They were in private hands to, the, to a family of a Marquesa and the professor had never been allowed to see them, but we made neighborhood connections and I got my Eureka moment to literally meet my ancestors. Here you see the hands of Diego Arias Davila, um, the, a funeral sculpture in this um, subterranean uh, chapel. Next uh, um, slide, please. That was an unforgettable moment. The sculptures were almost life-size and included not only the figure of Diego, but here you see his daughter, Isabel. Isabel's descendants would later flee to Costa Rica, a backwater far from the Inquisition and its investigators. It's the only, it's the only reason that could explain much of the early migration to a poor country like Costa Rica, because these were educated and wealthy immigrants. Next slide, please. But the chapel was missing one figure, the 15th century funeral sculpture of Elvira Arias Davila, my grandmother, 16 times removed. I knew the structure exists, the sculpture existed, and I was particularly interested in Elvira because before she converted, her name was Clara. As it turns out, that was a Spanish version of my own daughter's name, Claire. I felt we connected across time. Then more serendipity. I came across an old museum article from the 1990s about new objects acquired by the National Museum of Archaeology in Madrid. There I discovered Clara's stone epitaph. You see it there on the wall, though her sculpture, her actual sculpture was in storage. Um, next slide, please. Clara intrigued me because the um, Inquisition testimony showed clearly that Clara was a Christian convert in public and a secret Jew in her home. Spies in the neighborhood reported that Diego and Clara repeatedly ate this forbidden dish of adafina. It's a dish of meat and, fit and vegetables slow cooked overnight on coals on Fridays and served on Saturday for a Sabbath dinner. There were other clues inquisitors found. Um, since they were publicly Christian converts, Diego and Clara could not be buried in the earth in a Jewish cemetery outside Segovia. But in Clara's old age, she made sure that the women who tended her buried her in a plain shroud and placed a small symbolic sack of earth with her when she was entombed. The investigation of Diego and Clara never apparently resulted in a trial, but their son, the bishop, fled Segovia with their bones and died in exile at the Vatican in Rome. Next slide, please. So what does this mean today for my own identity? I have not formally converted because I know how I feel inside, a Jewish soul. I have searched for a synagogue where I could fit in and I'm now part of an international community called Hineni that meets online and is run by a reform rabbi in Berkeley, California. Uh, rabbi Zimmer, Jill Zimmerman offers classes, Shabbat services, and prayer groups emphasizing spirituality. But it's not easy, as Jeannie mentioned, to pass this identity along to the next generation. In my case, I encourage my daughter to head off on a birthright tour to Israel with other young French adults. I wasn't sure they would accept her, but they did, with, with questions, of course. When I took Claire to the airport with her suitcase, she held back from the group initially. They're Jewish, she told me, and I have a secret, I'm different. I couldn't believe in that moment that 16 generations after Clara was investigated by the Inquisition that my Claire was still talking about secrets. No secrets, I said, we're done with that. Tell them who you are, and that is what she did. And I will never forget that they learned a forgotten part of history and taught my daughter how to say her prayers. If this story has shown me anything, there is nothing simple about who you are and where you come from. My relatives and ancestors like Luz left us an identity, a sacred gift, a sense of self filled with the family history of triumphs and failures. And this journey has done this. Whenever I face my own struggles, 
I think of what my ancestors achieved despite persecution and repression. They stand behind me over centuries, pushing me forward. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you, Jeannie. So now I'm going to give Mariana a chance to go through your many, many questions. And while she's doing that, I'm going to tell you about our upcoming programs at the Susan Mendes Foundation. So next week is the final program of our spring series of our Sunday programs. Then we're going to have a break and we're going to then resume with our summer series that starts in late July. So let me tell you about some of the programs. So next week is Father's Day. It's also Juneteenth. We're focusing next week on a, an important Jewish dynasty called the Morgenthau family. There was Henry Morgenthau Sr. who first sounded the alarm about the Armenian genocide around the World War I period. He was the US ambassador to Turkey. His son then became the Secretary of the Treasury in the Roosevelt administration, and that was Henry Morgenthau. And it's thanks to Henry Morgenthau that uh, Roosevelt finally established the War Refugee Board that then saved so many people. Henry's son became the District Attorney of New York. That was Robert Morgenthau. So on this Father's Day program, we present to you three generations of this remarkable family devoted to justice and civil rights. We have a film called Morgenthau, and now we're going to show you a little trailer. I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the District Attorney. He took down the real gangs of New York. His father helped an American president save the world from evil. His grandfather exposed the world's first genocide. Three remarkable men, one family, Morgenthau. Then we have a break for a few weeks, starting up again on July 24th for our next series of programs that promises to be just as inspiring, informative, and uh, inspirational, I hope. So um, the first story we're going to show is called The Children of Shaban. This was a film made in the 1990s that uh, the Los Angeles Times called one of the most heartening Holocaust documentaries ever made. So we have the filmmaker and we have one of the children saved in this small town of Shaban. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to show you the trailer. Let me just tell you, after that, two other intriguing programs. We're going to have a program on Dr. Seuss and other cartoonists who protested the U.S. non-response of the Holocaust. Dr. Seuss, in addition to writing children's book, was also a political, a political <coughs> cartoonist in newspapers. And so we have Raphael Medoff, who's written the book called Cartoonists Against the Holocaust. So that's quite an exciting and interesting program. And then after that, we'll have a program on the hero, Jan Karski, who went around to different uh, world leaders to try to stop the Holocaust from happening. So right now, we're going to show you a trailer to the remarkable film, The Children of Shaban. They were refugees and orphans, children of the war. I arrived in Chaban in 1941 on a very cold day, a very sad little girl. Rescued by a small French village that knew neither prejudice nor hate. We were German Jewish children in a community that probably had never seen any Germans before, probably never seen any Jewish kids before. Many of us, perhaps most of us, never saw our parents again. So these young adults who took care of us were our parents. So that's my announcement about upcoming programs. And Mariana, 
please unmute yourself because the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doreen and Jeannie. They're fabulous stories, very, very powerful and important. Uh, there are a lot of very good questions. First one is how to print the timeline. So perhaps um, uh, I could ask Michael to put it up again and you can take print screens, but um, we can also uh, share it uh, se separately. Then there were questions about the, the names of the towns. Um, so uh, I think Jeannie, you, you mentioned uh, the, there was a message about Fermosé, but there were, you were also in a Portuguese town, correct? Your family? Yes, in, in Portugal, they uh, lived in Bragança for 220 years, and they went back and forth, um, Miranda, Miranda do Dauro, Mogadauro, and um, they also lived in Alcañices for about 60 years, and at times it was Portuguese, at times it was Spanish. Okay. Very well. And then um, I guess uh, the Braganza is in the uh, top uh, northernmost part of Portugal on the Spanish border. So it's uh, it's an area where there are a lot of towns with the uh, with the uh, Jewish traditions. Uh, Doreen, I guess you were your family was mostly in the Andalusia and um, well, Segovia, Segovia, Segovia. Right. So um, then there was uh, there were several questions about um, what I call the signs that your family might be Jewish. Uh, you, both Ginny and Doreen, you both um, highlighted a few of them, uh, the foods, the intermarriage. And so I, there was one question that, that uh, I have for Doreen. She talked about the dispensation to marry a first cousin. Did you both find that that kind of document? Yes. Um, I, you, yeah, yeah, you could find those in, in genealogy records. I think I found those even remotely. I'm trying to remember how I found that. Um, no, at that point, I had a genealogist that I hired when I first started in Costa Rica, and he found the dispensations. Yeah, I have I many, know, many of find. those. They were first and second cousins. I have the document where the church gave them dispensation. Finally, with my own grandparents, they did not get dispensation. And um, when I got my hands on the document, they I saw the request for dispensation. They didn't get it. And they married civilly, uh, finally, in 1922, I believe. Um, but I, I can talk to some of the other symbology in my own family that doesn't go back. Uh, my grandmother taught me how to check for blood in the eggs which you're not allowed to eat blood in, at all uh, under the kosher laws. And my grandmother, my mother insisted to bury her within 18 hours, which is what Doreen had said as well. I think that all of this is passed to us matriarchally. I don't ever recall my grandfather telling me anything. Um, I think the women are, well, we're doing the passing down. And um, I think that we share a lot of uh, the same stories, the same, things, the same burials, the same, in other words, we, we all share these stories. Uh, another example that I think I forgot to mention was um, uh, my great aunt Luce, who I showed the photo of um, and was kind of the keeper of the secrets, um, had a menorah in her cupboard. Um, and after she died, my, her grandson, my cousin told me that she used to pray by the menorah in the cupboard. Um, but sadly, I had never asked her questions about it. I'd live with her for a Spanish immersion program. I, it was just so out of context. I, I, I wouldn't have even thought to ask her um, about her history. Okay. Then um, th still on the signs, I think I, I could add the question here, which are um, in the intermarriages and the hidden part. Um, there was a question of whether these, uh, some of the signs that you found on the walls and so forth, if they are the same ones that they were found in Portugal in one town where they actually found a, a, an active community, a Belmont. Yes, yeah, you... well, it, Belmont doesn't have as many as Guarda or Trancoso, because Belmont is really, there was a huge Catholic community there as well. But yes, the symbology is very similar. 
um, they have these menorahs, they have um, they have the mo most of the symbology are Catholic crosses, either sitting on top of a menorah or sitting on top of the Hebrew letter Shin, or there's the Hebrew letter Shin, which looks like a W on top of the cross or on the sides. So a lot of it is similar, but not exact. There's books written on this in Guarda in Portugal. Okay, very well. Uh, this is um, for the community. We, I was just in Belmont recently, and the the new uh, synagogue is functioning. So that's that's um, that's very good to know. Uh, there were several questions about your your um, research uh, pr uh, process, and so and um, you described it in some detail. There was a specific question of when did you each choose to hire a genealogist, and how much did you do on your own, and how much did did you have a professional help to find to to get through your your walls as you mentioned them. Jeannie, per, first perhaps in Andorine. Okay, so luckily I was able to go, my grandfather had left me that tree back to 1725, but I knew that if I was gonna go to a court in Israel, I couldn't just go with a tree full of names. I knew instinctively, because nobody had ever done this before I did it, that had been written about, I knew that I was gonna have to find every document. So my, for all the church documents, like Doreen said, most of those are on family search. Um, the, the Mormon website, most of those are on family search. So those were easier to find. But once you had to dig into archives, I first went with my tree back to 1725 and said, just get me the tree, the, the documentation, birth, death and marriage certificate of these uh, grandmothers up to 1725. And um, when he started going further back, I had to research under the records because all of our information is under the record. How many kids weren't baptized? How, uh, you know, Doreen had mentioned this as well. What, you know, what was the name before? What was the name after? So a genealogist can only take you so far. He can show you what's in the archives, but he's not going to spell it out and he's not going to look at the clues for you. Doreen? Uh, in my case, when I started early in the process, I don't know, about 2007, maybe, um, I hired a lawyer in um, San Jose, Costa Rica to look for records for me. Um, that was at a time before the, the growth of all these databases, particularly FamilySearch.com. Um, so he found some things for me, but the best was as the databases evolved, there was much more that I could look for, birth, uh, marriage, death records. Um, in addition, there's also um, Spanish archives to look at Inquisition records, um, which I also use, but um, sometimes they didn't have everything indexed in the system. So when I was looking for um, the uh, in Inquisition investigation of my family, I only found the index number because I found there was this book in 1981 where a professor had basically transcribed the Inquisition records of this process against the Arias Davila family. And there it had the, the code. And then from there, then I had to formally request it. Um, and I went to Madrid and I, I looked at it there. But there's a lot available now that, that you can do remotely. Okay. Thank you. But Mariana, I think that you can see by both of our answers and everyone that's here, this is doable, but it's not for the faint of heart. It's, um, it's a true under the ground search for all of this. I mean, and, and it's, it's physically too, you saw Doreen's family under the ground and you saw my tunnels literally under the ground. And uh, it's, it can be done though not for the faint of heart. Thank you. Um, yes, um, I, one of the questions that has come up as well, well but before that, you, both of you speak Spanish, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Yes. So you were able to, uh, in Portuguese? I no. understand the written <laughs> Portuguese, not the Brazilian, okay. but the one from Portugal. Well, I, I can find some Portuguese teachers for you. But meanwhile, um, 
that so that would make so you actually use language to get through some of these uh, some of the paperwork. Uh, the one of the questions that's coming up now, which I, is very important, which uh, having to do with the reconnection, how you what you chose to do with the, with the, with this information then. And uh, for yourself, for your family, for your children, for dealing with other members of the family who were not quite on the same trip as you. And then there's a question here about that part of the reconnection, which is, uh, which has to do with dealing with multi-generational legacies of trauma. And I, that would be um, an interesting topic if either for both of you to comment. Uh, perhaps uh, Doreen this time. Well, I, I'll start with the, the trauma issue. Um, I'm, I've always been interested in that idea of intergenerational trauma, particularly passed through Holocaust survivor, survivors living in Paris. I'm very conscious of that. Um, but in, in our case, I think um, the way it was passed down was just the ability to keep secrets. Um, and that people were more discreet and they stayed away. And somehow that was passed on from the 15th century, the, 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 the fear of um, revealing too much. So in that sense, I think they passed on this discretion as opposed to trauma. Jeannie, what do you think? Well, I'm currently spearheading um, a global project on um, actually uh, looking at the trauma directly. Um, I have about 1,100 participants. Uh, this is being done in conjunction with the Weizmann Institute and the Institute of Jewish Genealogy in Israel. We're pursuing information such as phobias, fears, trauma, secrets of the family. And for example, by far, I mean, I am deathly afraid of fire. I can't go near it. I can't look at it. I can't even look at it on a screen. It's very difficult. And by far, the fear of fire, for example, is going through this study um, as we're getting through it. Um, and so this is uh, actually being done for epigenetics to see how much of this uh, trauma is being passed in the DNA. So let's hook back up in about a year or so, and I'll let you know the <laughs> results of that study. <laughs> Wonderful. We'll definitely have you back anytime you, you choose. So now let's turn to our speakers for their final thoughts, starting with Doreen. Well, this ties in with some of the questions a little bit earlier. I was just going to suggest um, that I guess my final thought is that everyone should try to explore their family history and the paths on that gift to the next generation. I've given you a few steps of what I've done, but the best summary is to start with, with what you know, talk to relatives, write down their stories. Genealogy is not just about death and birth records, genealogy is storytelling. And what fascinates me is the connection of people to history and their stories. As I mentioned earlier, it's so much easier to do research online now with databases like FamilySearch and Ancestry.com but a, a reminder, but to tell these stories, it's important to talk to relatives and to immerse yourself in family history by giving yourself a, war, a reward and taking a trip to the homeland, wherever that is. And finally, um, one last thought, studies have shown that children benefit from knowing the stories of their ancestors, their triumphs and their failures, because it makes them feel more resilient. We are not alone. Our ancestors stand behind us. What a nice Thank thought. Jeannie, what would you like to share with our audience in closing? So in closing, I would like to say that if you feel that you have these types of roots, that you have any kind of a feeling that you just have to look into it, I have found that it starts with the tiniest, tiniest of little question marks inside of you, in your heart, in your soul. Pursue it because I have yet of the many, many, many thousands of people that have approached me that have had this tiny feeling that it has not panned out in one way or another. So pursue, pursue it. It's in your genetics. It's inside you. Just uh, don't brush it off. If you want to know, go for it. You can find it. Mariana, I know you had some words you wanted to say in closing. Yes, uh, but Doreen, uh, they're asking to repeat the name of your, of your online uh, 
congregation, quote unquote. The community. Uh, it's it's called Hineni, and maybe afterwards I can um, get technical help to post the uh, website. Uh, Rabbi Jill Zimmerman. Jill, uh, she, uh, Jill, Jill Zimmerman. Okay, and Hineni, H I N E N I. And she's based now in um, UC, uh, Berkeley. Berkeley. Very well. Well, I do um, want to say um, one thing. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, here in Portugal, we uh, this, of course, as I said, is part of our story too. Uh, it's part of the story even of the Portuguese uh, expansion in the world. And uh, we've uh, suffered as well through this, uh, this uh, pressing down of lots of important histories. Uh, stories in our history. And uh, the Susan Men's Foundation is dedicated to rescuing one very important story that was also hidden and attempted to, uh, and um, erased for many per for many years, which is the story of Aristides Sousa Mendes. So I encourage you to keep digging, to keep learning about Aristides to Sousa Mendes, to visit Portugal, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll be cousins. We'll find out we are cousins after all. <laughs> Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Mariana, for moderating. And thank you to our extraordinary authors, speakers, Doreen Carvajal, Jeannie Milgram. Thank you to our audience, of course, that comes week after week. I do hope you will come back next week for our final program of our spring season. Uh, after today's program, you will receive an email with information about the, how to sign up. So have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Bye bye.